So let's let's move on a little bit now to to really the I think is going to be a very important issue, which is which is the methods of of diagnosis. And so if we think back that prior to 1990, so uh, when many of us trained, uh, we really didn't have transrectal ultrasound. We we didn't have PSA. What we had was we we determined who needed biopsy based upon an abnormal rectal exam as well as uh, maybe a non-specific test and that was prostatic acid phosphatase but pre pretty much it was due to an due to an abnormal rectal exam because we didn't have ultrasound because we didn't have biopsy guns basically there were just a few ways to access the prostate and most of it was through a very crude and archaic trans or transperineal triangulation method and you know tr hoping not to take off the few uh, top layers of, of epidermis in your index finger, it, it was a you know, very challenging way to, to access the prostate. So just from a, from a historical pr uh, perspective, as many of, many of you know, then uh, some individuals started looking at transrectal ultrasound uh, and concomitantly uh, the, the biopsy gun, which actually was, as many of you also know, was used to actually do percutaneous breast biopsies, uh, came into vogue. And a couple key individuals in the United States, one of them being a urologist, Bill Cooner in Mobile, Alabama, really were, were early pioneers in transrectal ultrasound of the prostate. And many of urologists gravitate, gravitated towards that. And the reason why I think urologists got into this space was because of the fact that ultrasound equipment was relatively inexpensive compared to CAT scans uh, CAT scans at that time and then ultimately MRIs and those things. So pretty much traditionally the standard of care for diagnosing prostate cancer has been transrectal, uh, transrectal ultrasound needle or ultrasound guided needle biopsies of the prostate in a sextant fashion and I think most people would agree that it's two cores per sextant with 12 cores being your typical typical biopsy. We, know, we also know, however, that, trans, that uh, traditional sextant biopsy, ultrasound guided, uh, does have some complications, sepsis, bleeding, hospitalization. We also know that there is significant undersampling of the prostate. We do not do a good job of, of accessing the entire prostate. Unfortunately, what, we're, what we some of the recommendations which we'll talk about later for active surveillance is really based upon this type of biopsying technique. So there is, there is significant movement now trying to figure out how do we, how do we biopsy in a, in a more, uh, in, in a better fashion, if you will, to sample the prostate and, uh, and, and what technology is out there. So, um, Dr. Albala, to give us your sort of insight, if you will, a little bit on this uh, concept of multi-parametric MRI fused uh, with ultrasound. Well, I think that this is a, sort of an evolving area as we're seeing today that we now are trying to superimpose or use other imaging modalities to help us with our transrectal ultrasound biopsies and, and what's been studied and it still continues to be studied is, is the use of MRI. Uh, MRIs are, you know, 75 to 80 percent sensitive in picking up cancers. Uh, it, it picks up extra prostatic extension quite well, seminal vesicle involvement um, really quite well. The, and the problem is, is the cost of these studies, it can be significant. You know, some insurance companies may not pay for this um, on a routine basis, but um, I can tell you that we're starting to see this shift going from, and we've seen this evolution, I think, from when we used to just put our finger in and biopsy with a, uh, you know, with a, a biopsy gun to ultrasound and now combining multimodality to, to pick up these cancers, especially at an earlier stage. I mean, it's one thing when you see a patient that comes in that's got full-blown metastatic disease and the rectal exam picks up the hard prostate. What we're trying to do now is identify these at an earlier stage, and then we can make recommendations whether they need to be treated or not. So I think that, that we've started to use you know, MRI and help us with, with our um, 
patients and not only whether to biopsy them, whether to follow them over a period of time, that these studies really can be helpful for the urologist. Yeah. So, it was interesting. There was, um, I think it was at SUO, either last year or the year before, um, someone, I forget who, was giving a talk about MRI, and they had trained at NIH, done their fellowship there, talked about how wonderful the MRIs were in their NIH. They worked with the radiologists, beautiful images, and they went out into practice out in the community and just got the local radiologist there at their local hospital to read the MRIs, and he said it was awful, couldn't see anything. He spent about a year working with their radiologist, fine-tuning it, getting the T1 and the T2 and looking and, and really, you know, fine-tuning it. And then a year later, he was finally getting images that he saw at NIH. And I, I think, you know, my perception is there's not the awareness that there is a lot of technical reader differences in that. It's not just, oh, I'm going to order an MRI and get my results. You really need to work in a multidisciplinary way with the radiologist to really fine tune that. There, the, the biggest problem is there's no real standardization. I mean, you can go regionally around the country, you know, at, at certain centers they may really have perfected this, and then you get into some of these smaller communities out there where, you know, MRI aren't done on a regular basis and the radiologists don't have that experience and trying to have someone, you know, get up to the level I think we, we, it's a process in evolution. There needs to be a standardization. You know, we've done it really quite well in prostate cancer with low, intermediate, and high-risk patients, you know, and categorizing these patients. We haven't really done it with MRI and, and some of these other imaging modalities. Dave, this is pretty uh, popular in Southern California. I know UCLA is doing I'm assuming you guys are doing it at USC. Where do you guys uh, stand with with multiparametric MRI? Well, I, I think that it's a very useful modality for, for looking at the prostate, and I think it's the best imaging that we have. Um, we wouldn't advocate doing it in everybody. And so the, the sort of patient that we're looking at is someone that comes and has a single core of Gleason 6, and we're saying, okay, we, we want to do we want to do surveillance, and we then make a decision about whether we're going to do some sort of tissue marker on them um, with some of the new tests, or we're going to do, we're going to do an MRI. Because I think that in terms of someone who, who where you're going to uh, do surveillance on them, if you've got the MRI and they uh, have a biopsy that shows six in one area, what you're worried about is there's something that you've missed because of undersampling with the biopsy and they've got a, a Gleason 7 or 8 sitting somewhere else in, in the gland. And an MRI that suggests that uh, there are not other significant foci I think is very helpful. Uh, and I think it's reassuring and we're trying to do active surveillance with many more patients now and I think that's a good thing and in that setting I think it's helpful. Yeah. Right, I, I mean my my reading on this, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that this is, there's lots of questions that needs to be answered. I think, David, your point about lack of standardization, especially here in the United States, the Europeans are, are much, much further along, but, but, but still, even, even there, it's, it's not standardized. I think you have the issue of, of whether or not to use an endorectal probe, and I think most people believe that if you have a three Tesla unit, you probably don't need the endorectal probe. There's the issue of, uh, in and of itself, if you see an index lesion, which which many people believe, well, that's the one that's actually causing, you know, going to be the more aggressive lesion. Is it, is the technology good enough that it, that uh, that you don't need to biopsy? Most people believe that no, you still need to biopsy that area. There's the question of do you do targeted biopsies just of index lesions, or do you do targeted biopsies as well as uh, systematic as well with targeting? Then there's the, the issue of do, you, do we still do transrectal biopsies, which is what the urologists are very comfortable doing, or I know there are some centers in, in Germany and Japan that are actually doing a combination of both transrectal and transperineal. So I, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but again, I think with, you know, specifically with, with this particular imaging technique that, you know, there potentially could be some advantages uh, in terms of the ability to more adequately sample the entire prostate better than what we do now. Now, David, you